Mr. Kilt, are you there? Yes, how is my order coming through right now? Good, I can hear you. I think you still need to share your screen. Okay, excellent. All right. All right. Okay, there we go. So good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone, whoever is joining from different parts of the globe. So I'm um, still not seeing your screen. Oh, there we go. Should be seeing okay, now. There we go. Yep. Okay. All right, excellent. So um, thank you all for joining us this uh, day, you know, to visit Automotive Spice for cybersecurity. So in this presentation, uh, you know, one of our main focus areas is going to be the Automotive Spice for cybersecurity um, standard that's come out. Uh, but also we're going to talk a little bit about some of the um, other aspects, for example, the UNECE R155 that actually led way for some of these standards to come together. So, um, yeah, so as Miles mentioned, if you have any questions, please do enter it on the chat and we'll be happy to uh, get to them uh, at a later point in the presentation. All right, with that, um, let me go forward. So a little bit about Omnix. Uh, if you haven't joined us in a webinar or haven't trained with us or um, you know, uh, are using our software solutions or haven't used our consulting. So uh, this is probably a first uh, you know, time that you're hearing about us in that case. So I'll uh, just keep it very brief and introduce you to Omnix in that case. And here it is. So we are based out of Ann Arbor, Michigan. Um, and uh, we have a global presence. Uh, a lot of our folks are actually in the writing committees of uh, international standards. And, uh, um, you know, the uh, uh, specifically our EVAV, uh, electric vehicle and autonomous vehicle division, uh, focuses on standards such as functional safety, cybersecurity, SORTIF, and the likes of it to uh, help accelerate uh, the, the electric and autonomous vehicle, you know, uh, in initiatives of various OEMs, tier ones, and tier twos. So uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that later. Uh, quick you know, view of some of our global offices and regions. Uh, we are actively into automotive, uh, aerospace, semiconductor, uh, medical devices, and general manufacturing, along, along with, of course, EVAV, as I just mentioned. Moving ahead. Uh, Omnex as a whole, we help our, our customers with uh, gap analysis, training personal certification, implementation and coaching, um, uh, also design and engineering services. We help with assessments and audits and also product certifications as well, for example, functional safety. So if you ever need help with any of those, uh, feel free to reach out to us and we'd be more than happy to assist you with that. All right, so why are we joined here today on this presentation? So, um, you know, you, you're more and more hearing this term called software-defined vehicles. And you're hearing about how uh, there's vehicle V2X communication, not just V2V, but V2 vehicle to many other uh, devices, like uh, vehicle, you know, uh, uh, different types of electronic components in the highway infrastructure, et cetera. So there are so many different ways that the vehicle is talking to different uh, external objects. So we're also talking about over-the-air communication. So if you're talking about uh, real-time updates, uh, you know, having the software of your car updated while it's in the, in the garage. So those are the kind of things that are, uh, one, making our lives better and easier, but at the same time, they're, they're, these are risks that we need to seriously consider and mitigate as we think about cybersecurity. So um, EN, the UNEC uh, R155 requires 
Among others, that the vehicle manufacturer, uh, you know, identification and management of cybersecurity risks is performed in the supply chain. So when this was introduced, uh, we are looking at how can we implement this. So of course, one of the obvious candidates in the in the industry is the ISO twenty uh, ISO SAE twenty one four three four, the cybersecurity standard. But also we have the automotive spice for cybersecurity that is also paving way for all of this. So today, of course, our presentation is mainly going to be focusing on automotive spice for cybersecurity, but we'll touch upon some of the related standards as well. So the automotive spice is a recommendation of VDA to identify process related product risks. And then uh, what they did is we have some cybersecurity related processes that they have introduced specifically that you can integrate into automotive spice. So automotive spice has been around since about the, you know, the, the latest version has been around since 2017, the PAM 3.1, the PAM 3.1. So this one is attempting to integrate into the, the PAM 3.1, uh, the automotive spice for cybersecurity. All right, so let's look at the agenda real quick. We'll be talking about uh, UNECR 155, the 21434 standard, summary of ASPICE, and also ASPICE for cybersecurity as well. So if you're looking at uh, the, uh, you know, the UNEC WP29 regulation with other standards, you have uh, on the slide, there are cybersecurity and cybersecurity management system related expectation. And then you also have software updates and software updates management uh, related expectations in the R156. So these standards that we have listed on this, the left-hand side here, so that's the 21434, also have hardware security, OBG2 security, and the ISO PASS 5112, uh, the automotive spy, the VD automotive cybersecurity management system audit. So that's more into the audit uh, side, so, you know, more, not so much into the product development, but more on the management system audit side. And then of course the automotive spice for cybersecurity as well. And then on the right-hand side, we have uh, standards on the software updates and, uh, as, as well, uh, two of them that, that have relationship back to the WP29. So in the R155, um, It has a large number of stringent and specific requirements for the OEMs and vehicles that they manufacture. Now the requirements go into OEM specific sections, vehicle specific sections, and also backend server holding vehicle data related expectations as well. At the end of the day, what they're saying is that OEM is still responsible for implementing all of these requirements. So uh, also one thing to think about while we look at this is there are a lot of other standards as we mentioned in some of the previous slides. So what are those significant standards that help the OEMs uh, to, to implement this goal, right? Okay, all right, moving on. If you look at the table of contents of the WP 29R115, you can see that it deals with approval, certificate of compliance for cybersecurity management system, specifications, modifications and extension of the vehicle type, conformity among many others. So this one, there are certain items that are, as we said, vehicle specific, and then also you know, those that go into uh, general management expectations as well on how, how you produce the vehicle, et cetera. Uh, moving ahead. Let's talk about 21434 there. So this standard on in comparison to, you know, the, the um, uh, uh, you know, a lot of times when uh, this was for, this first came out, there was parallels drawn for this with the functional safety standard. There was uh, parallels drawn for this with the 27,001 standard. So yes, there are overlaps of 21434 with those standards that I just mentioned, like functional safety and of course, um, uh, the other standard, which is uh, the uh, uh, automotive spice for cybersecurity. But um, really um, here, uh, sorry, the 27001, which is more of like an organizational uh, information security management system. 
Over here, one thing to keep in mind is that uh, this has a very strong focus on product development. Going ahead. So in this cybersecurity, of course, we're talking about uh, the product development part of this. So when this standard was initially uh, you know, being developed, there were some other standards also around that, that, that uh, you know, had impact on it. So let's talk, take a look at those over here. And I see one uh, also on the call. So one, um, if your audio is coming through fine, uh, would you like to talk a little bit about uh, the automotive uh, you know, 21434 development? One's also contributor to the 21434 standard. So one, if you would like to uh, make a comment on that. <clears throat> Yeah, yeah. This uh, slide talks about the uh, standards and the projects that were were in, in uh, development at the time that the twenty one four three four was being developed. So as you could see here, you 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 see several standards in the area of uh, diagnostics on the left with the OVP two port, in the area of hardware security on the right, which is uh, TPM, the trusted. Uh, processor module and then in the middle you have the uh, OTA the over the A's over the air interfaces and then on top you have a bunch of other projects which are a bit more generic uh, however some of them are related to this uh, UN ECE which you know it's very relevant to this to this <clears throat> webinar but also there are other standards that starts with X dot and those are European type of standards, totally related to automotive. So the point of, of this slide basically is to say that when 21434 was being developed, it was not the first and only document or standard regarding automotive cybersecurity. There were many other projects that were very important, okay? <clears throat> so go ahead, Nikhil. Thanks, Mark, thanks. So here, uh, again, as we said, uh, in this, besides, of course, uh, requirements around uh, product development, uh, 21434 did go into some expectations on when you do manufacture these vehicles, what type of uh, controls you need to have in place to ensure uh, that, you know, the product at the end of the day is defect from, I mean, free from cybersecurity risks. And of course, they do have expectations on a general um, cybersecurity uh, uh, management system being in place at these uh, respective organizations that are developing these kinds of products. So that's where 27001 comes into the picture. So here you can see a relationship of some of the other standards that have influenced in the generation of the 21434. As you can see here, of course, 26262, uh, the SAEJ standards there and the 27001, of course, and even ISO 9001, the quality management system had an influence on that. And of course the NIST uh, SP800, uh, you know, annex controls, even they had some, some influence in the 21434 um, standard there. And of course, they have led again further to inspiring some of the other standards that, that are in the um, uh, industry there. Here's a quick snapshot of what some of the main clauses of the uh, cybersecurity uh, standard uh, looks like. So at the very top, you have the organization of cybersecurity management. Then you have project dependent cybersecurity management. Then you have distributed cybersecurity activities. So if you have suppliers that are part of your development activities, uh, you know what type of controls you need to have that have to be established with the uh, suppliers. And then you have continual cybersecurity activities that is ongoing. Uh, uh, forever. And then over here is where more of your product development related. So you have the concept phase, and then you get into the product development with the V models of uh, product development. And then you have the cybersecurity validation at the right hand side. And then um, you have also post development phases. All of this has a, you know, it is lined up on the threat analysis and risk assessment methods, very critical activity. Uh, if you are familiar with the functional safety, you would compare it with 
the Hara activity, what the Tara is doing here. And here where you, where you end up with Cal values and risk values, while at the other side, you're, you know, you're coming up with ASIL values. That's the easy way to think about uh, how cybersecurity um, um, you know, executes uh, the threat, threat analysis and risk assessment methods. A very critical activity in the overall process, uh, as a matter of fact. So moving on to automotive spice. So why did we talk about these two standards? Because 21434 does have a big role in how the automotive spice for cybersecurity came into picture. And of course, before I talk about the automotive spice for cybersecurity, I need to talk to you about the traditional automotive spice, the automotive spice PAM 3.1 for a minute before we jump into this. So automotive spice, um, you know, has been around, uh, as I said, you know, this, this particular version has been there since 2017, but even before that in various forms, it's been there for, for more than uh, a decade and a half. So um, here we are focusing specifically on quality of, let's say you have embedded systems and, and software that go into a vehicle, uh, like, like a ECU or a sensor, any of, anything of that matter, matter of fact. So how do you ensure that the product, the software was uh, developed following due process and you have good quality at the end of the day? So over here, uh, that has been leveraged and your uh, VDA has introduced a few more additional processes, which we'll get to in a few slides. That is what Automotive Cy uh, Spice for Cybersecurity is all about. So very simple. You have the traditional automotive spice. There's a framework. On top of that, you build a few cybersecurity blocks or processes, and that's what you get as automotive spice for cybersecurity. So this is the framework of the, uh, the traditional automotive spice. So here you can see there are about 32 processes if you count them, out of which you know there are about uh, uh, there are about, let's say, 16 processes that are marked in red, which we call as the VDA scope. So the VDA scope is considered as a typical minimum set of processes that need to be implemented. Uh, and typically what, let's say, an OEM would ask a tier one to implement as the, the tier one, uh, you know, develops, let's say, uh, software for embedded systems. So, um, Going ahead. So here comes Automotive Spice for Cybersecurity. So what Automotive Spice for Cybersecurity has done is they took, uh, you know, the UNEC regulation R155, as we already said, required vehicle manufacturer for uh, identification and management of these cybersecurity risks, right? Not only at their own place, but even in the supply chain. So that's, uh, Automotive Spice has been already uh, used as a tool by OEMs to ensure quality within their supply chain for any type of software that's developed uh, or embedded systems. So at, at that point of time, uh, they wanted to take uh, this as a, as, a, as a vehicle to transport those additional requirements of, for Automotive Spice for cybersecurity. So here, cybersecurity related processes have been added into the proven scope of automotive spice. Automotive spice is widely used. Initially, of course, very prevalent in the European side. It spread very well to the North American side, Asian uh, you know, continents and every, everywhere. So it's very, um, very prominent these days. So uh, that's a great way for these requirements to be communicated in the automotive supply chain. So to support process-related product risks that are cybersecurity relevant. And that's again, the, the, the key goal of uh, Automotive Spice for Cybersecurity. So this is a screen, I mean, a picture of the, stand, uh, the standard there. So let's take a look at the framework. So specifically the framework introduced a few additional processes than what was there already in automotive space. So earlier I showed you a similar picture where 
we had about 32 processes. So here, if you count all of the blocks, it's come to about 38 because you have six more processes that have been added on to top of this, which starts with supplier request and selection. So all of these processes have something to do with acquisition. And then here you can see system engineering process group, software engineering process group, and they've introduced cyber security engineering process group, which will again integrate over here with your product development. And then you have management related processes such as project management, risk management, and here very specifically cybersecurity risk management. And then there are supporting processes at the bottom and then a few others as well, reuse process improvement and supply process groups. So these are the different processes and if you look at the ASPI spam 3.1, you see those same, same processes there as well. But th these, the ones that we have highlighted in the red boxes, those are the new ones. And um, yeah, so that, that, that's something to think about. Now, a quick view of some of those uh, related standards there. So uh, over here, you can see ISO 27001, 2013, the information security management system. So this is more done at the organization level. So you're thinking about controls. And this is where if you think about NIST standards, 853, 800-171, those kinds of standards help you to bring those annex controls, which are very important in implementing 27001, where you can get certified. Omnex, uh, we are ourselves certified to 27001 uh, among the, the other standards such as ISO 9001, uh, and, and the likes of it. So uh, that's something we pride on an integrated management system uh, within our organization there. So besides that, we do have, you can see the VDA Automotive Cybersecurity Management System Audit, a very interesting standard because here, uh, some of the requirements go, if you know standards like IATF 16949 or the 9001 standard, this one, uh, the type of audits uh, you know, the, the, the auditors for these uh, types of standards can in, in some way build off on some of their auditing experience in those uh, standards. And you just need to have additional experience for, for uh, VDA automotive cybersecurity. So this one again is more geared, to, geared towards the organization itself, the management system. So it's, it's not as detailed into the product development side, which where the 21434 and automotive spice for cybersecurity goes. TISAX, another one, Trusted Information Security Assessment Exchange, another framework used by some of the OEMs to ensure that, um, well, some, some tier organizations are not certified to 27001, but at the same time, it's like a minimum set of requirements from 27001 uh, where you could be uh, you know, assess to tie sacks and then be um, saying that, yeah, you know, uh, we meet those requirements. 21434, of course, we talked about that in breadth, uh, you know, depth. So uh, one, if you would like to add any comments uh, on this topic, um, you know, feel, please feel free to do so. <clears throat> yeah, right. Uh, so <clears throat> we have to distinguish between uh, standards for the product and standards for the organization. Because in cybersecurity, even for the automotive, as you can see here, there are many uh, standards that, uh, for some people, they appears to be you know, just overwhelming. But it, uh, I would like to say that uh, one of the main things to distinguish would be which one up applies to the product and which one applies to the organization, to the company. So uh, I saw 21434 is definitely for the product. And then TISAC and BDA and this ISO is mostly for the organization. But correlated to the topic of this uh, webinar, you know, which is a spice for cyber security, is definitely for the product also. So I would, I would uh, again uh, say that a very important consideration is to take a look at this, all of these standards and, and figure out which one is for the product and which one is for the organization. Okay. Good point. Thank you, Juan. So, uh, 
Um, looking at, uh, you know, the prerequisite for, for, exa for example, performing an assessment using the automotive spice for cybersecurity, Pam, is that there is an existence of an A spice assessment result for BDA scope with a compatible scope, a compatible assessment uh -huh. scope. So what does compatible assessment scope mean? So let's say you have been uh, doing, let's say only, you know, systems level development. And in some cases, your uh, supplier might be doing all of the software. In some cases, we've seen that. So you have not been assessed to software development. Uh, whereas in some cases, you're not responsible for system, but you're responsible for software. This affects what your scope is from within the VDA scope, the 16 processes scope we talked a little bit back. So uh, given that part of it, um, um, something to consider is that um, it, 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 whatever you're getting access to in automotive spice or cybersecurity, you need to have an, a pre prior existing um, uh, result of assessment similar to what you're all, you know, what is there in the traditional A spice. Uh, you can't do it something very different here and there, and that will be a, a problem. So I'm gonna walk you through some an example where uh, the organization, let's say, has already implemented Automotive Spice. And let's say the implementation of Automotive Spice is to level three capability. That's the assumption. And of course, that means VDA scope of 16 processes. You have some type of standard processes that exist. Tailoring guidelines also exist. If you know Automotive Spice, PAM, you know, already PAM 3.1, you know these terms uh, as well. So key processes in Automotive Spice Cybersecurity PAM, what to focus on while implementing these processes. So now we're going to shift gears a little bit uh, to focus on what are the key elements to look at for these six processes that we said are unique to Automotive Spice for cybersecurity. So that's what we're going to be uh, focusing on a little bit in, in this. So specifically ACQ2, supplier request and selection. Uh, the goal is to award a supplier a contract or agreement based on relevant criteria. So, you know, let's think about this for a minute, even before going into the process. Isn't cybersecurity important when you are having a partner that's going to be working with you in the product development stage? Absolutely, yes. So it would be obvious that you need to make sure that th these criteria are passed down to that supplier while you're uh, performing the supplier request and selection, right? So supplier evaluation criteria to include uh, organization's capability of supplier regarding cybersecurity, uh, continuous operation, can they support like, you know, what if you do have specific type of threats and everything that are found, um, you know, post, uh, uh, you know, the vehicles are on the field, how can those be addressed? Uh, technical evaluation regarding their cybersecurity capabilities. What type of testing activities? What type of uh, uh, you know detection capabilities do they have? Um, and also, uh, you know, we uh, in supply chain you talk about scorecards. So if you do have scorecards, and how have they been performing in previous projects? So evaluation of potential suppliers on evidence of organizational cybersecurity management system, information security management system, and support from organizations QMS. Something similar to that is, for example, getting certified to 27001. So if you have something like that, that's going to really help you with ACQ2. And then potential supplier identification based on the evaluation and issue, issuance of an RFQ with corrective action plan for any identified deviations, where, of course, you're going to do final negotiation and awarding the contract or agreement. So... Uh, Typically, you have something like an interface agreement that is established. Uh, and of course, you know, during, let's say you're doing an audit uh, as part of your supplier selection activities, and then you do find some discrepancies and you're going to document that track uh, it to closure. Uh, or of course, you know, with the supplier, it'll be documented in the contract that they will have to resolve at a later point in time. So, for of course free and open source software, you don't you're not expected to have an integrate interface agreement uh, because of the nature of, of, of that. So if you look at this uh, very clearly, it can integrate with your IETF 16949, uh, 
uh, that is, um, you know, the uh, class 8412 supplier selection. So it can have a very uh, good integration with that. And most organizations um, that are in the automotive uh, supply chain, if you do manufacture automotive products, you are certified to IETF 16949. If you are just design only, then you are uh, probably ISO 9001. Cybersecurity risk management, MAN 7. So if you remember in the uh, framework that we talked about a few slides back, there was one process that specifically dealt with uh, cybersecurity risk uh, management. So on this, uh, the main focus is determining the scope of cybersecurity risk management. For example, project, project assets, cybersecurity properties, damage scenarios, uh, impact categories and product and related product phases. So defining the cybersecurity risk management practices, for example, risk identification, analysis, evaluation, uh, uh, evaluation determination, and all, also risk treatment determination, all is going to be falling within the MAN 7 scope. So looking at this, if you know 21434, you probably know where this is going towards. And uh, specifically, this one has a very good integration with the threat analysis and risk assessment methods within the 21434 standard. So um, Juan, um, do you wanna talk? Um, yeah. yeah, sure, yeah, yeah, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> so this, uh, this is actually close 15, what it's uh, shown at the bottom here. This is from 21434. And we're trying to relate this back to MAN7, what they're talking about. So MAN7 is actually more generic. It's talking about cybersecurity risk management. And uh, if you know about uh, uh, security, there is so many ways to do risk management. It's very broad. But at the bottom, they're talking about or applying actually to what the standard 21434 adopts or says about risk management, which is, you know, this particular method. So this one is a very special method from, from uh, the standard 21434 that many of you may know, may not know, but uh, there are other equivalent methods. This is a very specific method. So if you don't <clears throat> understand or comprehend or apply any of these methods, there are similar methods that is equally valuable in terms of man seven, okay? Yeah, that's all, thank you. Thank you, thanks, Juan. So, um, moving ahead. Cybersecurity, okay, actually, I do see some questions on uh, the, uh, the chat here. So maybe we can pause for a minute and try to address them. Um, so let me take a minute and talk about this here. One of them is if you do design, you're either a remote site or ISO 9001 certified. Um, so I think, yeah, that's, um, that's, that's more of a statement. Yes, that is correct. Specifically on the IATF 16949 topic. We also have another one. Um, a spy cybersecurity is a draft currently and not yet released as of now. Uh, which model year vehicle are required to use this model? So here is the thing. That's more of a question for your OEM, I would say. I'm not, I'm not sure if uh, you are from a OEM side or from a tier one, tier two uh, specifically, but that's more really left up to the OEM to decide. So it's not that you must be certified. Um, uh, this is, I would tell you, ASPIS, for example, when it was introduced, it took a little bit of time to mature and be widely adopted. Uh, but given that it's already there, ASPIS for cybersecurity may not take as much as long, but at the same time, uh, it's not like it's widely mandated uh, yet. We do see cybersecurity requirements, a lot of OEMs still passing on, where 21434 still does apply. So um, that is you know, still uh, relevant. Uh, Juan, do you wanna add anything more to that? Yeah, well, <clears throat> ASPI cybersecurity is uh, issued by BDA, 
you know, it's really not a uh, standard, it's mostly like a best practice. So like Nikhil said, you know, it's up to your organizations to really determine how important it is for you. Okay, so uh, yeah, that's my answer. Thank you, Juan. So going ahead. So here, oh, sorry. I think I jumped a slide there. So yeah, let's talk about cybersecurity requirements elicitation. So this one, um, you know, at, at the front of it, it looks a little different, but the objective of this is to derive cybersecurity goals and requirements out of the risk treatment decision that involves risk mitigation. And you're trying to maintain consistency between the risk assessment. Some of the key outputs of this is defining your cybersecurity goals, deriving your cybersecurity requirements, which includes, of course, both functional and non-functional. So requirements for post-development, for post-development, which includes like production, operation, maintenance, decommissioning, all of those come out from this as well. Now, consistency and bi-directional traceability, some of the expectation now, ASPICE is very well known for this requirement in terms of its bi-directional traceability expectations and consistency, where, uh, you know, by, between cybersecurity requirements, you need to have it going back to the goals. And for the goals, of course, back to the threat scenarios. So this, again, is a very important piece of that puzzle. Now, uh, here, uh, you know, it's also said that we're talking about a continuous uh, refinement of the requirements during various iterations as we go through this process. Here, uh, you know, uh, here, of course, uh, when we talk about, for example, communication, which is another process that you will see when you go through the V model processes with an A spice, it applies to all of them here, okay, to all the uh, product development processes. So, here, of course, this can integrate with the concept phase of product design as seen in 21.434. Why concept phase? The cybersecurity goals, a very clear uh, indication there. And, uh, you know, that, that's, that's where it integrates. The cybersecurity implementation. Here, this is past the concept phase, but you're actually talking about product development where you're getting into the trenches of it. So here, implement risk treatment actions that involve risk mitigation to reduce any residual risk of, uh, to an acceptable level. So through this cybersecurity implementation, uh, you're trying to uh, you know, achieve the following objectives, like your architectural design is going to be refined and the cybersecurity requirements are going to be allocated to the elements of the refined architectural design. Sounds familiar? Yeah, because this is very similar to what, again, even uh, functional safety does. You're, you're going through, you're coming up with an in initial preliminary architecture, you're going to revise it, uh, similar approach there. And uh, appropriate cybersecurity controls are selected where, uh, you know, of course you're talking about like, uh, how do you either pass it on to a different system or how do you avoid or detect, et cetera. Those types of decisions going to the uh, details of it. Architectural design is again analyzed to identify and evaluate any vulnerabilities. One, maybe uh, if you would like to maybe uh, spend a minute talking about, uh, you know, as, as we talk about maybe performing, um, um, you know, an analysis on architecture. Uh, you, you, you know, you worked with a lot of architecture. So maybe just share your thought on how Cybersecurity mm. has a big impact on the architecture of the product. How is that related? <clears throat> yeah, absolutely. Uh, we're talking about uh, mostly, uh, let me talk about vulnerabilities here. So a uh, vulnerability is a weakness in a uh, design or feature or implementation of uh, the uh, development that you do in a, any system really. Uh, so, and that could happen in any, any area. So. Here we're talking about uh, vulnerabilities at the, uh, at the design stage. So when you do the design, obviously nothing is perfect. And later on, you may find out that uh, whatever decision you have made will imply into a vulnerability that is identified 
are not actually exploited by attackers. And that's where the, you know, the attack surfaces are all about. So this particular topic is, is definitely very, very, very critical. And, it, and uh, as it's shown here, it starts at the design level, okay? But it actually moves down to the uh, operation level, for instance, where vulnerabilities are actually discovered. So vulnerabilities can be discovered right away at the design, but many of them, perhaps most of them are identified at the uh, operational level when the product is actually in the user's hands. So when the, you know, when a driver <clears throat> or a user is actually, you know, using the, the vehicle, that's when some vulnerabilities are discovered by, by attackers, okay? Okay, great, great, great talk, yep. Yeah, I think uh, you know that that architecture piece is very critical, especially as you said with the attack surfaces, how they have a very uh, strong relationship into identifying those. And uh, yeah, so as we say, it has a strong relationship to the ship to the product product development phase there. Now, when you go to risk treatment verification, uh, you're trying to confirm whatever you implemented, right? They comply uh, and. Uh, with the with the requirements of uh, the cybersecurity requirements, and of course what you have in the refined architectural design, and or, or and the detailed design as well. So, uh, when you consider risk treatment verification and integration strategy, you need to consider degrees of independence for verification, and also different types of methods, which goes into any type of testing and uh, verification and validation activities. Right, so that's very critical. And uh, uh, this covers, of course, typical uh, verification activities such as risk treatment verification, which includes the test cases that you're going to be using for uh, for this activity, um, and verification activities according to a specified strategy and criteria. And at the end of the day, all of this again has between you know again tra by direction traceability requirements. When you talk about verification, I mean this is typically what we say, right? You're talking about can the design do what it's supposed to do? That's what you're trying to see in verification. While you get to validation, you're checking whether it satisfies the intended use. So when you think about strategy, you also think about typical items such as what is regression, uh, what type of methods you're supposed to use, techniques, tools, um, and what type of work products you're supposed to generate at the end of the day this goes into any process and of course a very clear plan and schedule to go along with uh, the, the the verification activities because remember when we began this this example walk out you know walk through we said we're taking the example of an organization that is already level three certified in automotive spice and that's what we're basing this out of so it is expected some of these uh, ca the capability to have bidirectional traceability and to check consistency is already there uh, you know, going here. And uh, this can, of course, integrate again with the product development phase. And talking about risk treatment validation, as we said, does it satisfy the intended use? If so, that's what validation is about. So here you're talking about uh, including cybersecurity relevant methods to detect unidentified vulnerabilities. So this is where like your pen test and those activities become very uh, important. Examination of the achievement of your cybersecurity goals. And of course, um, at the you know, going back and forth, uh, the consistency and bidirectional traceability between cybersecurity goals and the risk treatment validation specification. That is more all about risk treatment validation there. And specifically, uh, clause 11 within 21.434 has uh, the, the requirements for cybersecurity validation, and this has a natural partnership between the two of it. So, you know, we've talk about, talked about automotive spice for cybersecurity, and it's very clear there is a great synergy between the two. Uh, there are you know, some areas that go very well. Uh, so 
just again scoping to those six processes, let's see where is that overlap. So supplier request and request and selection goes into your clause seven distributed cybersecurity activities. And uh, over here, where you have your cybersecurity uh, citation, that that's again going over here. I think there's a small formatting issue there. Sorry about that. And you can also see concept phase uh, where we talked about um, you know the cybersecurity goals coming out of it. And there's again that relationship, and then risk treatment and validation with the clause eleven there. Something went with my formatting that seemed to have moved some of the shapes around. Sorry about that, uh, but yeah. So, if you were to implement implementing automotive spice for cybersecurity, what do you need to do in addition to automotive spice? So, of course, the requirements from automotive spice for cybersecurity will need to be integrated into the standard process at the organization. You need to have tailoring guidelines that will need to account for projects with cybersecurity impact. And appropriate training will need to be planned and provided for all teams, all the way from sales to product development to manufacturing processes. Why do we say sales? Because the next time you get a new project, let's say you're a tier one OEM awarding your contract, uh, technical sales, they're the first people to lay their eyes on and they're able to say, oh, okay, there seems like something on cybersecurity. So to know at least at a high level, what are the types of terms and uh, you know, I, things to be looking out for, that's what we're talking about here. And of course, product development, man manufacturing, a very clear relationship there. And when you consider tool chains used in product development and supporting activities, you must be again able to uh, support uh, whatever is required for cybersecurity there. So, um, well, um, naturally you wouldn't want to use, uh, you know, um, any uh, software components that are having cybersecurity risk already known to it, right? So you do want to, um, in, in functional safety, they talk about, let's say, tool qualification activities. There are no specific requirements on Automotive spice for cybersecurity on that topic, but still something to be thinking about uh, as we go through this. Now, if you're considering the automotive spice for cybersecurity processes overlap, then you have ISO 9001 slash IATF 16949. And over here, if you look at it, Automotive Spice for Cybersecurity has 38 processes. We said that the 32 from a, a Spice and the six you add for Automotive Spice for Cybersecurity. If you collectively look at it, processes that do overlap with A Spice for Cybersecurity are everything in blue. And everything in orange is the ones that do not. And you can see that, especially with PAM 3.0, naturally 32 processes do overlap. These six are unique. Whereas with ISO 9001, even you can see there's about almost 50 percentage overlap there. 21434, of course, being the highest without question, all the way to about 27 processes. So big deal there. Now, when you look at work products, I was showing you processes before, now I'm showing you work products. So with work products, the difference here is you have about so many of these work products uh, that, you know, that have a clear overlap. And um, there's a the high percentage uh, with work product overlap that you can again see there. Um, interestingly, the work product and the processes number are almost identical. And that's why you're seeing the same relationship there. But the numbers you can see are different in terms of overlap. With uh, uh, 21434, there, there are more work products. Earlier to 27, now you have about 32. In, in terms of work products. And then similarly, you can see that, that overlap going between the two. So when you talk about process and work product integration, what does it look like? So with process, uh, naturally, if there are processes, for example, you're talking about supplier request and selection. If there is a requirement on ASPICE and there is a requirement on functional safety and also in IETF, Naturally, you don't need to have three different processes. You just need one where it has requirements from all. 
Similarly, when you talk about work products, if you have, for example, a cybersecurity interface agreement or the distributor interface agreement, you can consider the relationship between the two and coming up with a related document that can incorporate both of these expectations. Here's uh, an example. So interface agreement for, from ASPICE for cybersecurity versus cybersecurity interface agreement. You can see that the, the expectations are gonna be very similar for a natural candidate. You don't need to have two of them. And uh, over here, we have again, the Automotive Spice for cybersecurity and a Spice Spam 3.1 over here, when I'm talking about the overlap, um, we, we said that, of course, these are the processes that, that do have a, uh, just, just revisiting the framework that we've been seeing, which has a great, great overlap. So let me just bring that on the screen. So you can see on this, ACQ4 related to ACQ2, um, and then MAN7 having a relationship by itself, but SIS1, uh, you can see related to SCC, um, SCC1, SIS2 related to your cybersecurity implementation, your software processes here, and your software and SIS processes here. So you can take these requirements and integrate into these processes. That's one way of doing it. Or else you can just have a standalone process as well. But again, uh, different ways of implementing the same requirements. To wrap it up, Juan, I will uh, request that you uh, summarize. Yeah, yeah, hopefully. Uh, <clears throat> we, we told you about the main things about this new, uh, not so new actually, you know, BDA document about uh, ACE by cybersecurity that touches upon the UNCE requirements R155. Also, it's uh, configured around the SAE requirements for 21434. And it touches upon other aspects of automotive spice and also 2701. <clears throat> and uh, obviously, as uh, Nikhil pointed out, this is a joint kind of effort. You cannot just expect one of these documents or standards to really cover everything. It's really a combination of several of them. So this one covers only the software aspects, which is very important. There are other aspects that are non-software that you need to take into account, like obviously hardware, and even the hardware software interface and stuff like that. The second point here is that this uh, document it's a good option for organizations wishing to incorporate cybersecurity practices in their product development, particularly from the viewpoint of software, as I pointed out before. And lastly, we noted that there is a big uh, overlap, not only in terms of uh, processes, but also in terms of the work products between automotive SPICE and also ISO 21434. <clears throat> so with that, We'd like to close with the webinar. I think there might be some uh, outstanding questions out there. Yeah, let's there cover the, the Q and A that we could we could answer. So let's let's go over to that one. Sure, absolutely. So <coughs> um, let's take a look at some of this. So what is the VDA scope referring to? Okay, so. VDA stands for it's just a German acronym where the brand the automobile. <coughs> Uh, just like what you have in AIAG in the North American side. Uh, similarly, it's just a acronym that supports, uh, you know, it's, it's the organization in the European side, that uh, consortium of different OEMs <coughs> that is trying to promote standards, you know, uh, such as like automotive spice. So it, it is spice parent organization is VDA. Okay, another one. Uh, I see what are the key differences between 21434 and ACE by cybersecurity? You do see there are similarities, but if a company is already following 21434, is it required to adopt ACE by cybersecurity or this is also tied to OEM preferences? Good question. 
I think there are multiple questions just to answer the first one. Key differences. I would say one of the main difference, of course, is the requirements that goes into production and um, uh, <coughs> post, uh, post uh, you know, development activities mainly. Um, the, the requirements in, in the sense that the implementation of those controls are not really looked to in an automotive space. Whereas when you talk about 21434, they do have importance to that. So there is more weightage on you know, uh, post product development activities that 21434 ha has versus what A Spice has. Um, secondly, uh, you know, because it's A Spice, you can definitely follow, you know, follow the assessment maturity level, the capability levels of um, level one, level two, level three. Uh, that's a big advantage, which in 21434's case, uh, you know, you, you don't have that type of an uh, approach currently available. So those two are some of the obvious ones that I can, uh, you know, come to my mind. One, do you have anything else to add to that in terms of 21434 and a space for cybersecurity? Yeah, yeah, obviously, these two documents were written at different times for different purposes. You know, ISO 21434 has a more broader purpose than a space of security, which was an add-on taking into account what was already done with a spy, which is, you know, a great, great work that they have done. <clears throat> but also you have to realize that, you know, a spice is only a software oriented. So there are some commonalities, but it's not intended to be a competition. You know, it's a, uh, different different documents, you know. <clears throat> there are some commonalities and uh, synergies, if you will, and that's the way you you want to look at it. Okay, what's the synergy? It seems to me that the best uh, way to take a look at this is that if your organization have invested heavily already in A Spice, then it would be a good idea to take a look at A Spice Cyber Security, you know. Mm. But if your organization have not invested heavily in A-SPICE, maybe you are, you know, hardware oriented or something like that, then you have to take a different approach, if you will, because there's so many commonalities, as uh, Nikhil pointed out. Yeah, that's a good point, Juan. And also, believe... oh, go ahead. Yeah. yeah, there is a question that's spe specifically targeted to me here from uh, Merdad Kavashin. It says, <clears throat> why the question, why the design cannot simulate the actual working conditions to minimize the vulnerability, I suppose it is. Yeah, I indicated that the vulnerabilities is a key issue in cybersecurity, uh, not only conceptually, but also uh, practically. It's very difficult to identify vulnerabilities. Sometimes vulnerabilities are out there and you cannot identify them and, and <clears throat> until it's very late, you know. But as to this question, uh, simulation, uh, the idea would be that you make a design where there are no vulnerabilities. However, that's the ideal situation, extremely difficult to do that, extremely difficult. You, I don't think uh, there is a design that can claim that there is no vulnerabilities in security, you know. You cannot say that, you cannot prove that. It's, it's extremely difficult. Uh, so uh, definitely a design can use simulation or any working conditions or whatever to minimize vulnerabilities. That's a given. I guess the answer is how well you do that job. You know, uh, at the end of the day, there's going to be some vulnerabilities left out, you know either to be find, found by uh, red teams, black teams, you know, whatever, uh, later on and exploited by attackers. You know, that's, that has been the history, at least in automotive uh, cybersecurity, okay? Good point, thank you, Juan. And um, yeah, so another question we had was on, <clears throat> um, yeah, request to have the draft version. Okay, so if you go to the VDA uh, website, um, you can obtain the Automotive Spice for Cybersecurity uh, standard, uh, at, you know, free of charge, I believe. Um, or actually, the well, here's the thing. If you're actually looking for the book itself, 
that's something you don't get a um, you you won't get a let me just go back to this one so if you're talk, talking about the book itself you actually have to buy it from the uh, from the VDA bookstore uh, they, they don't have a, uh, they don't have a, a digital really link. available yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> sorry yeah digital link available that's what I was trying to say and it's a, it is a first edition that's actually available. We used to have a draft before that, but as of August 2021, actually, I believe it's a, it's a first edition. So it's not a draft itself, but it's a first edition that's printed and available that you can purchase from the VDA bookstore, to be precise. Sorry if uh, you know, there was an ambiguity in our earlier uh, statement. Let me see if that's... checking if there are any other questions. So um, I believe uh, we have, yeah. All right, as a closing uh, statement, we just wanted to tell you, so we do run Automotive Spice uh, classes that take a deeper dive into 21434. Juan himself even does some of the, the training. We do have other, qualified trainers as well, experts in the industry. So if you are interested to learn more about that, uh, please do take a look. And we also have some Audible Spice for cybersecurity training plan for later in the year. And uh, as we said, if you have any requests on gap analysis, product certification, assessments, audits, and the likes of it, let us know. We'd be happy to help you with that. Some other courses related at the same time, um, we had to have the 21434 automotive spice for cybersecurity. Oh, sorry, that uh, and and uh, functional safety as well. Um, so do take a look at it. It's it's on our website. You visit omnex.com. Be happy to um, you know you can read more about the co the courses with that we do uh, as well. And also Sortif uh, courses. And then we also have the AIGVDA courses here. And here's a quick look at the cybersecurity training courses uh, to wrap it up. And uh, thank you all for joining. I know we stayed past four minutes our end time, but we appreciate you joining us today. And thank you for the opportunity. Um, looking forward to it. <clears throat> yeah, likewise, I would like to thank everybody for your attendance and those of your questions okay thank you thank you thank you everyone